I'm Brogan Martin. I'm a product manager at NRG Systems. Um, we are... Beauty. Um, who is NRG Systems? We're based in Heinsberg, for those of you who are from Vermont, so we're just about 20 minutes south of here. Um, who are we? We are a, uh, a company who sells typically hardware. Uh, we're trying to move more into services and software and things like that to the renewable energy space. So wind, solar, uh, and Jesse mentioned we're getting more into kind of wildlife conservation as it pertains to energy. Um, but we're a very mission-driven company. And another important thing here, this is a little bit of a case study. I'm going to show uh, one of the development uh, things that are actually in our product development pipeline right now. And we are very much a B2B company. Um, so what you're going to hear is, uh, this is my first UX uh, conference ever, not just speaking, but attending. So I'm a product guy, very much hardware. So, But I think that there's a huge intersection between what is happening in hardware development and how it's changing and what's happening just from UX and the digital side too. So that's kind of what I hope to uh, be able to kind of talk about today. I do want to just point out one thing, which is the difference between hardware and software. You could talk about it a long time, but I really only think that there's kind of two important things I think to point out and why our development might be a little bit different than kind of typical UX development, which is our escape bugs in hardware are much more expensive. We have shipped products to the field, sold thousands of them. You find that there is a resistor or a capacitor that needs changing and you don't do that remotely. And customers don't like shipping back all the hardware and doing the whole thing. So we have to be a little bit more diligent in the beginning because it's not as easy for uh, us to make those changes. Also, the second thing is that just the design and development is a little bit slower. So the analogy I like to say is you're doing the same thing, right? You're trying to create a picture, but we are the analog, right? We are film. So we do something and we set up the camera and we take the picture and we think it's right, and then we take that film out of the camera and then we bring it to the store and we wait for it to be developed and we look at our picture, right? Versus digital photography, which is you take the picture on your phone, you look at it, you say, oh, I need to change it, and you take another and you take another and take another. We just have a little bit longer cycle uh, where we can actually get and incorporate that feedback back on the product. So we have to, again, be probably do a few fewer cycles. But really there's more that I think unites us uh, between product and digital uh, than really divides us, right? Uh, there might be differences in time spans, but we're all trying to do the same thing, right? I'm a product manager, so I have to deal in all the different spheres. I don't just design, I don't do all these different things. I have to think of it from a business perspective. So what we're really trying to do is create sustainable businesses, right? You have to have more revenue than you have cost, right? For any product or project or anything that you're doing, right? Our customers, we want our customers to love the thing, right? And that is really, we know as UX professionals, that's what we're really going for. But it also has to be feasible. Everyone wants to do really high tech stuff and sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's not appropriate. And the hardest thing I find in the development is finding the sweet spot button between all those things. You could make the coolest thing that your customer loves, but if it costs 10x what they're willing to pay, no one will use it and you will bring no benefits to any customers, right? So we gotta find that sweet spot. It's just not about a great experience, it's about bringing value, right? So in the last five years, our company has gone through a pretty significant um, transformation in how we actually develop products. Uh, we used to be what I would call a very engineering-led organization, where engineers would come up with a really cool idea, we would develop it, and then we would introduce it to the market, and then if it didn't work, ah uh, shucks, we wasted all that money. Man, that really stinks. So, <coughs> we've really started incorporating more things like from the design thinking community into it, right? You, you emphasize, you define, you, you, know, you ideate, you do all these things. You're gonna see that. This, so this is a kind of a cartoon version of what our, uh, what our process looks like. It's called the double diamond, right? And really we have the problem space and the solution space. As hardware developers, we tend to spend probably a lot more time and it's a little bit more serial in the problem space. Because if you can really articulate and define what that problem is, then you can get your engineers to design a really cool solution that kind of checks all the boxes, right? So we spend a lot of time there. What I love about the double diamond is, really this is, uh, you're doing, you kind of break these things into two different phases, right? When you're trying to find the problem space, in the beginning you're trying to be very expansive. It's a divergent thinking exercise. You're trying to be very open-minded, and you are trying to cut all those different ideas and all those different needs from all kinds of different customers, right? And get as much into the building as you can, right? But at some point, you gotta close the door and say, okay, the input time is done, now we have to create insights, 
right? So now we're going from, okay, here's all the realm of possibility of the problems that we can solve to what is the actual problem that we are choosing to solve. And we have borrowed from the jobs to be done framework. So it's not about a product we're trying to build, it's about the job the customer's trying to do. That's what we're trying to define. Uh, and it's not just the, you know, we, we sell very technical products. It's not just about the engineering or the technical problem that you're solving. There's also the emotional experience, you know, behind it. And I don't think that, you know, all of our engineers have always uh, really appreciated that. But I think they're really growing to a lot more. And then once we get to that job to be done, now we can start having, having the fun time, right? The ideation. And again, that's the other expansive part. You start out with a problem and then you just explode into all kinds of different solutions that you could come up with. But at some point, again, you gotta stop. You gotta stop ideating, right? Because we're really looking for a solution. And being very clear when ideation is over and when it's time to say, okay, here's the three best options that we have. Let's prototype these and either do it for technical reasons, uh, you know, all kinds of different things. Now it's time to close the door and start whittling down to what we're actually gonna do, which is our whole solution concept, right? I use the term whole solution, anybody's right, right, right crossing the chasm, I mean very much the literal whole solution, right? It's not just the product we're gonna design, but it's the people who are gonna deliver the value to the different channels, it's all the different ancillary equipment that might be needed to deliver that whole solution. So, I'm gonna focus really uh, about the product that I did on kind of the, the things I think that have the best intersection with the UX community, which is first of all the research that we do uh, at Energy Systems. So I'll kind of start there. So we've really built our uh, experience in this over the last probably three years. And honestly, I think the toughest bit is as a product manager or a product owner, you really like to think that you're in touch with your customers and you're, you're the expert and you are within your organization, but I tell you that you are not your customer. You are not. I, you have great insights and I hope you're very empathetic but you are not that. You don't know what they're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Which leads me to my corollary, which is research is greater than empathy. I think empathy is really, really important, and I think it really helps make better design decisions. But research is where you really get into the depth of knowledge and what their experiences are. So pulling those experiences out of them so you can tell your customers. I like this Mark Twain quote, what gets us in trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And I know personally as a product manager, I have had plenty of those experiences in my life where that's where I got in trouble. So, the example I'm gonna give you today, I'm gonna explain the job to be done, just to give you a little context, because it won't make any damn sense if I just start <laughs> talking about what the methods are that we use. So, again, wildlife conservation, the intersection with that and energy. Uh, wind turbines do, unfortunately, uh, cause mortality of bats and birds. It's probably not as bad as you've heard about it. And since 2012, the industry has been super responsible and responsive to making sure that it's minimizing its impacts on those species. Since 2012, every turbine, every turbine that's been put in the US in a plant has been monitored to understand what its impact is on those local uh, species. So how do they do that? And how can we try to make it better? Well, we use uh, one of the research tools that we use is ethnography, right? So this is actually uh, a, an image from uh, one of the re recent trips that we took. So how they actually determine the, their impact on these local species is they go and they walk around turbines and they look for small dead animals. So what I, this is a picture I took, my back is to the wind turbines tower and I'm looking down the road and that is about 80 meters to the edge of that, to the edge of that corn. This is in the Midwest. It's a big 80 meter crop circle, like you might think the aliens created or something like that around the turbine. That little, there's a person over here. Look over in this corner, you might see a little orange thing in a white helmet. They walk five meter transects, which means they walk a straight line and then they move over five meters and then they walk another straight line. And that's what they do to try to find these animals, right? It takes two of them to do a plot like this about 45 minutes or an hour. They're not very good at it. Right? I mean, can you imagine? A bat is smaller than the size of my fist. And that's what they're having to do. So they don't find all of them. They don't find nearly all of them. And by the way, if you do it twice a week, scavengers come in and take away those carcasses. It's a horrifically inefficient process and very costly. And it doesn't add a lot to conservation to do this. Right? You're spending money that doesn't really go to the conservation. Again, one of my favorite, favorite Stephen Blank. Uh, there are no facts inside the building, so get the heck outside. 
The other piece, besides the ethnography that we do, is voice of the customer research, which is really based around interviews. Um, so this is kind of the, the six step first process of actually getting to the wants and needs of the customers. So we have the interview, it can be in person, it can be over the phone. An over the phone interview, if you have the right rapport with somebody, it's not always easy to, to, to get there, but it's better than not having it because you don't have the budget to travel, right? So we do a lot of our stuff over the phone. Record it and transcribe it. If you don't have a transcript, it didn't happen. That is literally our company's policy. I don't care how good you think you are at taking notes. If you're trying to have an interview with somebody and make a connection and you're writing notes, you're either too distracted to really have a connection with them or you're too connected with them to write good notes. So record it, transcribe it. I cannot tell you how many of these interviews we've come out of after where someone was actually with, you know, two, we always do a buddy system, usually it's a product manager or someone from the commercial team and an engineer, again, trying to build their empathy up a little bit. Um, but you come out of thinking like, can you believe that they said this? And the other person said, they didn't say that. That's not what they said. Then that's something totally different. And you say, you've got to be kidding me, right? And so you both have notes on the same thing, but you both took two different things away from it. You've got to transcribe it. Why is that so important? We really believe it's really important to maintain original customer language because customers have, uh, it's, it's an emotive thing, right? It's not just, you will translate it to business speak and in internal business jargon. I guarantee if you take notes because you're trying to do it fast. And really, you want to retain that customer language. So these are some of the interviews we did when we're talking about folks walking around these wind turbines. So this is their experience. So this is actually from a project manager, not one of the people. You don't want them doing more than six hours a day. They reach a point where you're just worried about putting one foot in front of the other. How would you take that as a note? What would you write in your notebook? Would that strike you? No. But it shows something really important, which is this is really difficult work that no one likes to do, right? Next one. Again, a, product man a project manager for one of these. Can you find places for your people to live that's near the project? That is often, excuse me, that is often more of the challenge than anything else. This is not something from a product perspective that you're necessarily going to fix, but it's a pain point that you're trying to address with what you do. And then this is my favorite. We got one of those sites that's in a very active rattlesnake mode. <laughs> So you get great stories out of these interviews too. This is down in Texas and someone told us there was one wind turbine that they were doing that had a known rattlesnake den and what they call the searcher efficiency, the searcher's ability to actually find the carcasses was awful. Because can you imagine walking and your job is to look for a small dead thing, but in the back of your head you're like, I'm actually looking for rattlesnakes. <laughs> I don't care about the small dead thing. That's just what I'm getting paid to do. So those are really kind of the two big things. And again, this is kind of more of a case study and a little bit of a synopsis. Uh, I, I love everything about you know, doing the interviews and all the kind of the pro tips that we got earlier. I wish I could talk about it all day, but we don't have time. The second is the prototype. Critical, critical prototype. Um, I'm gonna kind of first define what we mean when we say prototype. A prototype is an early model built to be learned from. It sounds stupid simple. Like, yeah, that's what prototypes are for. But learning is so important. It's not to verify that you have the right design, and it's not to validate anything. It's to experiment to see, did you do the right thing? And there's a real difference. So again, we use a lot of like lean startup concepts. So this validated learning cycle, build, measure, learn is really important. Now, I'm not gonna go into it today, but when we prototype, we prototype in the business sense, using business model canvas, we prototype in the technology sense, just like you might imagine a bunch of engineers in a lab would, would prototype. Uh, but we also uh, prototype in the, in the customer sense. We do it a couple different ways. We do concept tests and things like that. But what we also find, and again, more from, you know, uh, oh, is think about the customer journey. Now, we're hardware folks. So this to us is very interesting, but we think about more, that's the sales and marketing perspective on really the customer journey. So we have defined in our hardware world a little bit of an oper what we call an operational customer journey, right? Which is after they order something, they have to do go through all these steps to make it work for them, right? And so you gotta think about not just, hey, how well does my widget work? You gotta think, how do I receive it? We ship things on pallets all the time, right? Do they, can they receive a pallet at their, wherever they are? You know, do you need a forklift? Do you need a truck that can lower the thing? Do they have a pallet jack? Think about these sorts of things, right? Installation, learning to use, maintain. I don't need to go, you know, you, you, you get the gist. But what we find is simply uh, doing really small scale experiments, even at our place, especially with installation, tends to be one of the ones where you have the stickiest problem, right? So to solve the problem that we were talking about, which is humans walking around wind turbines looking for small carcasses, we are using machine vision to try to achieve the same thing. So again, 
cameras on turbines looking down, looking for changes, which will identify when a carcass lands in the field of view. This is our first prototype. This is, uh, the, and again, very early. So it's a big old box, and it's got two security cameras sticking out the bottom of it. And uh, everything's packaged in one, super efficient. All you do is feed it power, you can wirelessly blah, blah, blah. Great, right? What a great design. Well, we're going to install these things about 18 feet off the ground is what we needed to get the right field of view. And so I was the, uh, I was the lucky volunteer up on top of the ladder. We put it up against the side of our building and we said, what's it like to hoist that box and then magnetically affix it to the side of a turbine? We can only get 13 feet, so the ladder actually had to be two more feet higher when we were going to actually do it on a turbine. We just couldn't get that high on our, uh, on our building. I'm going to tell you, it is freaking terrifying to hoist up a 10 to 15 pound box while you're balancing on a ladder. Uh, and immediately after we did that, we were actually just doing this, you know, kind of like, oh, it's an experiment, but we're just going to do this so we can make, put together some work instructions so we can send them to customers and they can do the same thing. And as soon as we did it, said, this is not what we're shipping to customers. This is absolutely awful. So what did we do? Before we even ever shipped it to the field, we said, there is no way the cameras are going to be affixed to that box. That box is now magnetically mounted to the bottom of the turbine. And there's just a couple of cables that run up to the cameras that are now on top, right? But still, I'm on top of a you know, 15, 20 foot ladder. You know, 18 feet is where we're trying to mount the thing, trying to put two cameras. Oh yeah, these are windy sites, by the way. That's where they put wind turbines. I bet you knew that. Um, it's a little nerve wracking. Don't ever go to the top of a 20 foot ladder, even on a dare, right? It's not fun, even if someone's holding the bottom, right? So after that experience, we said, well, that's not a great idea. How do we keep people on the ground? And we said, well, we just need to kind of boost some equipment up high. So we got an extendable rod and a two by four and casters. And we said, hey, let's do an experiment. Let's see if we can you know, take this thing and kind of push it up the side so we stay on the ground and the equipment goes up and then it gets magnetically affixed. And daggone it, if that didn't work. And so that, that was our, literally, that's our warehouse. That's just the wall, it's obviously not a turbine. And we just said, holy crap, I think we can actually do this, right? So then we actually go through the mechanical design, and so this is actually what we're deploying to the field this year. Uh, on a, that's an actual wind turbine, as you might be able to tell. Uh, and no one actually has to leave the ground, right? So again, even if you can't just go to the customer, and so what we're doing now is the customer will now be installing it. After we've gone through our own kind of simulation, our customers will now be installing it like this. And now we'll actually get to get real customer feedback as to how it can be made better. But at least we went through a couple rapid iterations of how do we do this, and it was cheap. It was literally our time, and, and, think, and don't overthink your prototypes, I guess is the last, <laughs> last thing. It's, it should be a two by four in casters. If any prototype, should, you should have those two elements. <laughs> Um, I am pretty much over time already, so I'm going to skip over the prototyping. Uh, I do love this quote, dumbest person with a fact from anyone with an opinion. Um, this, uh, our politics right now maybe doesn't feel like that, but I hope product development still can. Uh, I'll go quickly through this. We used a web camera to test the zippers in our factory. It was literally a web camera you could buy it. Staples. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a Staples, but... <laughs> But we literally took little, little objects and uh, put them and just said, hey, can you actually see something that far away? And so that was the webcam. This is the one where we uh, actually, that was a little box with the two cameras. And so there I am again. There's a, a bat circuit. By the way, our bat circuits last year were cat toys we bought off of Amazon, which look amazingly like bats. No joke. <laughs> And then finally, our last prototype. So uh, that's us in the field. Uh, there's two orange cones right there. Those are actual bats. Um, so just to make sure we were making sure that they did look like cat toys, and they do. Um, so again, we're doing experiments where we're throwing these little surrogates out and saying, hey, can we actually see those? And again, we could. So prototyping, again, I mentioned the business model canvas. Uh, I, I didn't talk in depth here, but I come talk to me about it. I think it's an incredible tool to kind of do a business prototype, uh, customer journey simulations that I just talked about, and then the critical system technology, which is what we kind of just went through here at the end. Thank you all. Thank you.